I am afraid of love. Everything about it is terrifying, from giving someone else the limited time I have on this earth to having to understand the emotions of another when I don't even know my own. I've never in my life felt ready for such a commitment to say that I can provide something which I do not understand. And yet, I have before, and even now, after experiencing so much pain from it all, I still feel a drive for it. Alone at night, I want contact and reassurance as much as anyone else, and when faced with an empty dwelling, I feel the melancholy usually warded off by the energy of another. I crave to understand so that I may properly seek without hurting others or getting hurt myself as I so often have. But to understand means involving another who themselves will seek love and who can only be hurt by my exploration. So I find it a good exercise to see what the creative minds of the world tell us about love, and specifically today, the fear of it. So let's examine the subject, lay some groundwork, tackle a few series which talk about it, and I'll spin a bit of my own tale at the end. And of course, be warned, there will be spoilers. I think the only place to start is with the inexplicability of love. It is a formula that cannot be solved. Now, there are many scientific explanations for why humans form intense emotional bonds. Through observing our conscious and unconscious behavior, it's been shown that we are creatures wired to be social, and that has been reasoned as a natural or evolutionary response. Most of us are raised by people who care for us, even in the bare bones physical sense, providing an early example we follow through our lives. And as observed in most life, the ultimate purpose of life sprung from nature is to continue the species, not exactly itself. Individual survival instincts are simply so one stays alive to produce offspring. Humans, as creatures who evolve to rely on the brain rather than the body, do this best in groups to make up for our physical detriment. One human versus one lion is an obvious outcome, but 20 humans makes it a different story. And working together, we build walls so we never even have to face the lion to begin with. Whether we like it or not, it seems the bonds we form are simply natural. Love as an extreme version of this, then, is not inexplicable at a base level. But at the same time as we escape from the lion, we change love. Closed off from the threats we once needed groups to advance away from, our efforts return to less natural pursuits like business, literature, games, the logic of our world changed. Thousands of years ago, you may have needed a close-knit group to survive, but now you don't. Leaving aside if it's mentally healthy or not, you could wake up, go to work in a cubicle, hardly talk to anyone all day, go home, do the same, and repeat every day, and you'd survive physically just as well as someone who's interacting with others constantly. In the rapid advancement of the human race, where entire cultures could change multiple times within one lifespan, we outpaced these social evolutionary aspects. I say love is inexplicable because of this. The benefits of love, aside from monetary concerns like one dwelling or tax break for marriage, things that we have added to it within society, are mostly abstract. If I say love doesn't provide benefits, you'd likely point to how good it makes us feel, to mental benefits, things which can be felt, but not observed outright, only interpreted. That's why it makes so little sense to me when detached from the physical world. We can agree it's good and have an idea of how, but that idea will present differently in every single one of us. What we can define about it is that we have to care for someone else, give our time to them, or spend our money on them, or commit ourselves to them in some way. Physical limitations remain obvious, but physical benefits all come first through mental ones. There's no way to explain the benefits of love that would work for everyone because no two people will have the same interpretation of the reality it springs from. It's just like my arms can never be soft and warm. Not the way yours will always be. I actually didn't plan to talk about Violet Evergarden here today, but I think it explains this concept. Violet is a child soldier, formerly under the command of Major Gilbert Bougainvillea. I put command in quotes there because it was more forced than anything else. She was a gift from his brother Dietfried, a cruel man who described her as a tool and nothing more. Gilbert had no desire to see her fight, but she found the only way to feel valued by someone was for her utility, 
and all she knew was how to kill. To pay back the kindness Gilbert gave to her, she then did this. Having never been loved before now, she lacked the example we mentioned for how to then love others. So when the Major presumably dies protecting her, leaving her with the words, I love you, she's confused. What does I love you even mean? To her, it has meant nothing so far. She'd never heard it before. She has no way to associate it with a warm touch or a close hug or a hot meal. Without feeling much herself, she can't even pair it with particular emotions. The statement lacks all context. So when she becomes an auto memories doll, someone who writes letters for others to express what they can't, she witnesses many different forms of love. There's the overbearing care of parents, the hopeful solitude of siblings, the romance of youth, the lasting love of a mourning father, and even more. While she becomes adept at her career until the very end, Violet never claims to know what I love you means, even though she hears it in different words from every one of these cases. And that's exactly the reason. They're all entirely unique situations, each one expressing a different take which falls under the umbrella of love. It is at once the tears of a sibling who can't face their brother out of fear, and the anger of a father who can't face his daughter because she has passed. It is at once a romance which is starting from words on paper, and also one which is founded on the gentle feelings of an entire lifetime together. It is parents who are alive and distant from their daughter, and one soon to die who's always been right there. When all of these things which can be reasoned to contradict each other are love, then how do we ever define it? The answer is simply that we don't. Violet eventually claims to understand what I love you means, however we never witness her definition, and it seems she puts no more words to it herself. The answer is that there is no answer. We can only know by experiencing it. Our quests may seem more mundane than hers, but through home and friends and school and careers, we go through just as many stages and cases, picking up our idea of love along the way. Not one of us could describe exactly what they feel, and in no way could they ever use the perfect words to make someone else feel it in the exact same way. Love has reasons and logic, but it is also inexplicable. We can fear it so much because it is everything. This isn't helped by the fact that even though we escaped the physical reasons for evolutionary love, we still heavily focus on the physical in most of our societies. That extra capacity didn't go to understanding the emotions which now fully constituted love, but rather shifted to new concrete means. The advancements of modern science and technology are absolutely stunning, and fields of it like medical technology are developments no one can rightfully question. They are outright good. But for a number of factors, one of the most heavy being monetary gain, understanding the logic of the world became much more beneficial than the emotions of those within it. Many of you were probably raised under this mindset without even ever thinking about it. For me, accomplishments which could be tied to logical pursuits were the ones which were praised. The art project I brought home to design a building was met not with mention of the color or form, but that if I could do that, then maybe one day I could be an architect. Taking up our toys when I was younger in the hopes of building some weapon from a show that was on TV wasn't met with mention of my imagination, but the ability to simply remove screws or play with Legos being the sure signs of a future engineer. The repetitious acts of filling in blanks on a worksheet proved I must be right for physics, but entire canvases of imagination meant nothing for future pursuits. We're quite often trained and guided to be logical over anything else, the hallmark of science. The pursuit of it is great, but unchecked, and worse, co-opted by monetary or power-hungry forces, it becomes an all-consuming beast with no morality and can really inhibit our path to understanding love. It's funny how much things have changed. Just a few months ago, you were always so sad, you know? Here we have Steins Gate, a show which very much emphasizes that danger through the butterfly effect and CERN, the organization which will kill to get their hands on even a rudimentary time machine, leading the world to completely dire circumstances. That time machine was made, somewhat accidentally, by Okabe Rintaro and the Future Gadget Laboratory, the fancy name he's given to the few crappy rooms where he hangs out with his friends, messing around with miscellaneous bits of technology. 
Through anime science magic, a microwave above a CRT television set allows them to send text messages back in time, and eventually enough information to jump consciousnesses back as well, at least for Okabe. While he isn't a real scientist, he does have some ability and knowledge of scientific pursuits, at least of engineering since he and his friend Daru mate all these wacky gadgets, and he's able to somewhat keep pace with the in-depth work of others like Makise Kurisu, a genius who's published only at 18. While sometimes his arguments are nothing but conjecture, he still has the wherewithal to pull that conjecture from the right places. At the very least, he is extremely logical. But his longest friend is the most odd pairing given his other company in these traits, Mayuri Shina. A warm and bubbly presence, she's often the one bringing emotion to the table. As others bicker about hacking or theorizing or sit in silence unable to understand their emotions, she calms them down with appeals to togetherness while she works on creative pursuits like cosplay for herself and others. At times, she'll reach up into the sky, lost in some feeling which is incomprehensible to anyone else. Operating so much on emotions, it's difficult for Okabe to understand how to help her, even if he feels strongly for her. This comes out most after the loss of her grandmother. Mayuri is left so depressed she's unable to communicate with others, spending all her time at that grave. She begins to grow detached from the world, as if she'd soon float away. When she reaches for the stars here while Okabe is watching, he rushes in and holds her, claiming to suddenly be a mad scientist named Hoween Kiyoma holding her hostage and never letting go. Afraid she would leave him forever, he provided a reason why she could never leave. A cold, hard, logical one, stark in its contrast to how she operates and solving Okabe's conflict of not knowing how to help. He bypasses the emotional with physical, logical means. To someone with the ability to think most prominently in cold measurements, this is one solution to love. I mean, first of all, how do you organize your thoughts to express them? And then secondly, how do you make someone else understand them once you have? This is very difficult, but what if you didn't have to do either? What if you were simply able to skip all of that which you don't understand? This works for interaction overall. Unlike Okabe, the wandering, unemployed young adult, Kiyoma is someone with a defined role in interactions, some way to provide a basis to these unknown factors. He runs the Future Gadget Laboratory and directs the efforts of others. Daru is his hacker, Kurisu his assistant, Rukuko and Ferris his students in their respective tasks. I think understanding love is a reason for this. Anyone else who tends to overthink can attest to any number of good nights ruined by a few moments of this doubt, of not knowing exactly where you stand and what you provide to people. The way your friend coughed when you made that joke, was it genuine that it just happened, or did they simply want to avoid fake laughing at it to be polite? Maybe that's why when they get up to get a drink, they sat somewhere else next to someone else later on. And then, well, I understand it. I mean, if you can't make them laugh, then why do they like you? Why would they want to be around you? You weren't doing or can't really do anything special, so maybe they don't actually like you anyway. What are you for or to them anyway? What logical reason do they have to like you? Interactions are very complex, and understanding how someone else feels is almost impossible. The arrangement of Halloween Kiyoma avoids these issues. He knows exactly why they're around him, they work in his laboratory, and he provides them with knowledge, direction, and training, even if it's kind of bullshit. They have clear, defined reasons to love him, so there's no guessing for such an overthinker. Plus, these are controlled interactions. If you don't know what to say and are worried that an awkward pause is the spiral into hate somehow, then you mention the training you gave them on exorcism or special attacks. You can always tie back to those reasons, giving them a twofold benefit their definition and also guaranteed positive interaction. The basic elements in the formula of care. Someone who's something to us that we do things for. Kyoma is also, in a way, an act of service for these friends. Not just Mayuri in helping her have a reason to keep going, but by continuing the formula to its next extent. Those factors we listed may constitute care but that doesn't make it good, they just make it. So once you have the excuse for interaction, you want to make it one which is positive for them. 
You praise them on their progress at these tasks, give them ways to feel valuable with the achievements they find in your employ, act outrageous and outlandish so that at the very least, you're entertaining to be around. That's always something, right? Kyoma is a ridiculous persona, yelling openly about his mad science, speaking on a dead phone about the organization that's out to get him, surrounding his pursuits with pomp and claiming the righteous feeling of a fresh lab coat. There's always something fun, wild, or engaging to him, some sort of distraction from the pressures of life, like the ones which left Mayuri so depressed. Okabe knows deep down that Kyoma is a falsehood, so he finds genuine value from the persona, not just fake logical value. Kyoma does provide something positive to them all, and to someone else who seems prone to that kind of down feeling he seeks to save them from, it bypasses another fear, the bad times. A feature of this brand of overthinking mixed with logic is looking at interactions like an exchange. If someone gives you their time and all you can do with it is lack energy, speak about sadness, or be depressed, then why would they want to be around you anymore? It doesn't feel logical, even if you know that you yourself would still love someone through any of those days as Okabe did. People want good times and sadness doesn't feel like a good time. By playing the same beats again and again with Kyoma, Okabe puts on an act he can replicate in almost any conditions, only breaking down under the extreme stress of reliving the death of his best friend again and again and again and again and being powerless to stop it, even after sacrificing everything physically positive he tried to do for others. That's how much it took to break this act. Love isn't logical, but we can be. If it isn't a formula we can solve, then we might try to apply our own formula, control the variables, and get the desired result, which works to some extent. All of this is an attempt to generalize the extremely varied nature of love. Kyoma boils down the constituent parts to just the essentials and runs off of those. It does the job, and to some extent, it works. But it's also a constant duty, a lifelong struggle which amounts to stagnation when it inevitably fails. Love isn't something conquered by science or logic, even for those who do best with such things. We can fear it because it makes no sense, even as we need things to make sense. You're right. I am a horrible person. The world would probably be better off if I wasn't around. A silent voice expands upon the idea of needing to be something for someone by more directly addressing self-worth with regards to love. It shows why we feel that need in the first place. The story is of Shoya and Shoko, two future friends who began as anything but. Transferring into their class in elementary school, Shoko is bullied for being deaf. The other kids either pay her no mind, do so and are bullied for it to the point that they themselves leave the school, or are the ones directly doing the bullying, Shoya being one of the main culprits. Through these horrid interactions, they both find a complete devaluation of themselves. Shoko is essentially told she's worthless. When people aren't directly hating her for something she can't help, they're outright ignoring or refusing to help her and making sure that no one else does either. We return to logic here as our minds try to make sense of the interactions we have. Things happen for a reason, or at least we want them to. So what's our reason? I don't know what other conclusion someone can draw from seeing this over and over again than, I must not be worth the effort. If one person doesn't try for you, it could be anything. But when no one tries from you, there's one common thing. You. Shoya finds his devaluation later. Once Shoko is bullied out of the school by him and his friends, he's pinned with all the blame, helped along by the worst teacher in all of anime. The once bully becomes the bullied. He's forced to feel absolute shame rather than guilt, which could have led him to be better. He's locked into place forever, vastly changing as a person, but always looked at as the horrible bully since his former friends made sure to tell everyone the truth about him. He did something horrible and was never allowed to forget it or make up for it. Left alone forever, his logic kicks on as well. This must be the cost of his actions. He deserves to be alone for making someone else feel so. He is also worthless. So how does this then nest with our idea of love? The instinctual response of many when asked if love is valuable would be, of course. 
We could point to personal anecdotes, to published stories, life-changing narratives, even the interactions of animals outside of ourselves, and say this is something inherently beautiful and worthwhile. Even if it is just a chemical response in our brains trying to invoke survival of the species, we interpret that as value, and so it is. How many stories end in romance or the importance of family? How many songs are written about the process of loving and losing? How many nights have we sat and wished for the intimate company of another? There is a drive for love which speaks so deeply to the human condition, into our logic, our art, our communication, into the very recesses of our mind and spilling out into our interactions. Love is valuable. So what about when we aren't? Should we be allowed to love? Can we have love if we cannot contribute to that value? This is what Shoya and Shoko both feel once they reunite. Shoko has felt love in between the spurts of hate, but in addition to feeling worthless, she also sees herself as a burden on others. They have to take classes to communicate with her efficiently, those who showed care for her in the past were subject to harsh treatment themselves, and her family is left quite fractured and stressed. Would that be lessened without her, without the girl who was always needing new, expensive hearing aids and to change schools? who now needs to be taken to appointments and classes when other kids her age are relaxing at home. Logic once more. Aren't there others who deserve those warm feelings of love more? Ones who take less effort to maintain than her? What is she giving to deserve such things when someone else could do more for less? Shoya wonders if he has atoned enough to deserve love, part of his isolation being his own choice to pay for what he did. He literally asks, Am I allowed to have this much fun? He could be someone worthy of love one day. Maybe if he paid enough, he would be. But he's been atoning for years, and no one has started to treat him differently, right? So, maybe not. Maybe it'll never happen. If everyone says this is what he deserves, who is he to argue? So he shouldn't enjoy himself. He shouldn't be loved. Well, it may be natural for others, he's starting from behind. Maybe if he gave 200, 300% more than others, that would make love worthwhile to share with him. Now, all of this logic forms a somewhat transactional idea of love. Now, that word itself doesn't mean that it's bad. If we assume a completely normal situation with an even playing ground, this is fine. An equal give and take is, in theory, perfect love. But we see that theory is called such for a reason. Connection is not often entered from the same level. Shoya is, in a way, overgiving. By believing himself to be undeserving of love in return, he goes out of his way to try and make things better, and once he's repaired their connection, to make her life itself better. Even as he drives away his other friends, he continues spending as much time as he can with her. He often puts up with harassment for or from others, and thinks nothing of it. Shoko's younger sister actively insults and lies to him, yet he stops to help her every time anyway. When he thinks of leaving the world forever, he first earns back the money his mother paid for his bad actions as a child, working summers away and selling all of his things to do so. He's always giving more, but that's just how it should be. That's love for him. But everyone wants to give as much as they take, so what if someone he loves can't do the same? There's a specific scene where Shoko tries to communicate to Shoya as he did with her. She attempts to speak with him like how he learned sign language for her. But she's not able to do the same act he was, no matter how much she wants to and by no fault of her own. It must feel like she's holding him back, taking up all of his time and energy and not able to give the same efforts in return. Without her own input on the matter, she is overtaking just by the nature of her condition and what Shoya is doing. It's a miscommunication, one each side is trying to overcorrect on their own, driven by their lack of self-worth. Love is terrifying because we have to learn and communicate what each of us can give. It is a give and take, but there's nothing saying their levels need to be equal because we're not coming to it on level ground. Someone raised in a loving family their whole life and one without will likely have different ideas of not even just how much they should give and get, but what giving and taking even is. It's not that calling love a transaction is bad, even if it feels reductive. It's that it's like trying to set a price when everyone has their own currency and there's no exchange rate. 
That's what we establish with our communication. We build the bridges and close the gaps to learn what we can exchange. There's nothing saying it is equal or has to be equal. If both parties agree on it and it's healthy, does the tip of the scale even matter? We want different things and we need different things. So when we provide them in the combination needed, that's what matters. But we can never know that without communication, and we've already covered how hard that can be. This is what's stressed in a movie where that which seems so basic to us, and even then we fail at, is shown with two people who have a legitimate barrier to it. Shoko and Shoya eventually break down to each other, expressing their supposed worthlessness and how much the other means to them. They finally see firsthand what's so often hidden and guarded. They might not lay out an exact plan for how to be healthy, but they now know more of what the other feels and needs. Even if their relationship remains the same, the air has been cleared. They don't need to be equal, they simply need to be what the other wants. The way they got to recognize that was dramatic and almost cost each their life. Love is terrifying. Even experiencing something so great can drive harder home the feelings we wish to be rid of. Love was almost the last straw for them both, the thing which proved how little they were because it's so great. We have to be careful with love, detailing its ins and outs to make sure we aren't losing sight of the fact that at the most basic level, if we are part of something so great, then we must be valuable. Love is terrifying because it means loving ourselves enough to be loved. Everything was so horribly dry, even people's hearts. I always found myself wondering, how and why could they possibly keep on living? I think Trigun is my favorite look at the fear of love, though. Its main character, Vash the Stampede, is a wanted criminal, known as the Humanoid Typhoon with an insane bounty on his head for the destruction caused wherever he's found. Imagined to be sick, twisted, or sadistic, the man we find is anything but. He forgets to load his gun, goes weak in the knees at the sight of blood, and scarfs down on donuts. He's such a goof to the point where it seems unbelievable he could be such a feared outlaw. But there's more to Vash which explains his seemingly superhuman abilities and luck. Vash isn't human, rather he's a plant, a natural, living source of energy, the humanoid version of what powers the few remaining cities on this planet's surface. The civilizations which exist in any meaningful capacity have a plant, and the utmost concern of them all is keeping that important object up and running. Life itself on this world depends on what Vash is. But this also makes him a danger. While most of the destruction in Vash's wake is the result of someone else blamed on him, there are times where it is his unfortunate doing. Against his will, his power can be brought out in his angel arm and released into the wider world destroying entire cities in only a few brief moments. It's a torturous experience. Vash, at just his most bare nature, is able to offer this world and its inhabitants so much, but at the same time he can also take it all away without even wanting to or trying to. He would be best in the form of the other plants, tools which can be used and maintained, but keep locked away and safe. As such, he wanders. Vash is mostly nomadic, returning to a few places but without ever really establishing a home. Staying in one place is simply too dangerous for the others there. He can only live a peaceful life in solitude because of who he is, and who others make him. After the destruction of July, he became the legendary outlaw capable of flattening entire cities and worth 60 billion double dollars. The sum of money he's worth drives people mad, as even towns who see him for the kind being he is turn on him for the money. In chasing him down, they destroy themselves, shooting holes in their walls, taking down their towers with rockets, a self-inflicted destruction a round of ash, but not of his fault. Due to the greed of others, the necessity of money, the plans of villains, or simple bad luck, Vash always ends up as the seeming center of destruction. The world destroys itself around him, but he's blamed for it. So he goes anywhere and everywhere, making sure to most often never remain too long. But in this, a wonder arises. Why go near people at all? Vash isn't constrained by evolution or reproduction. He has nothing within him calling out for the company of humans. But he loves them anyway. The tragedy of Vash's character is that he's insanely empathetic, believing the words of his most influential figure, Rem, that all life is valuable, 
When he sees suffering, he wants to fix it. He knows he has the power to as someone who is above human limitations. He throws himself into the flames time and time again to help others, never giving his own body a break. It's covered in scars with a fake arm and patchwork metal holding it together. The mark of every save he's ever had is worn on him forever, a physical cost he can only bear precisely because he isn't human, but still loves them. Vash helps however he can whenever he arrives, and when he's done all he can, he packs up and leaves. That's the only way he can ever express his love for their sake. To reinforce this, he plays dumb in the hopes it'll seem like an accident. He accidentally dances into hostage situations or hangs around dangerous places because of attraction. He plays the villain they want him to be, once pretending to kill two star-crossed lovers hoping for escape so that they can do so in peace, away from their forced obligations, a stain forever on his name so that no one can know the truth. Whatever he can do to eschew credit to make his name even worse, he will do. He doesn't want people to love him back, to get attached, because if they knew how great he really was, how much he could do and how much he helped, they'd want to keep him around. And that's dangerous. If he didn't have a bounty, they wouldn't fear him or force him to run away. He needs to be seen as a fool to hate for the good of those he loves and sacrifices so much for. Most notably is Meryl. Over the course of the series, her disdain for the goofy man drops for the exact reason he was afraid of. As she and Millie chase the humanoid typhoon across all of this desert, they witness how kind and caring he can be, how much he loves and respects every life, and how hard he tries and how he does so. They get to see the real Vash, and Meryl falls in love with that, with the man who can never be seen as he is. It would be better if she kept hating him like she did at first. So when Vash knows how she feels, he disappears without a word as often as possible. The more reason she has to see him as a selfish asshole, the better. The second time his angel arm is forced to destroy a city, she was even right there, right in the thick of it because she was always around. It's nothing but trouble for her. Of course, there's some reason why Vash himself doesn't want to get too attached either. As a planet, his lifespan is longer than humans. Already over 100 years old and without signs of aging for many years, if Vash grew close with the people he loved so much, settled down and stayed with them, he'd have to watch every single one of them grow old and die. He'd have to see all of their pain and never be able to solve any of it, hurting himself the whole time, endlessly and forever. A witness to one of the harshest worlds ever where survival itself is a daily task, he is the observer of it all, destined to see that which he loves destroyed at every turn. The best thing not just for them, but for him, is to love as little as possible. And yet he does. No matter how much pain love inflicts on Vash, he never forgoes it. No matter how much his foes use it to their advantage, he never stalls on his ideals unless absolutely pushed. And when he is absolutely pushed, even when the man he's forced to kill is genuine evil, he cries. Love is often seen as terrifying because of how much we can get hurt from it. But Trigon shows that there's also hurting others, a fact which so often feels worse than hurting ourselves. We may not have hidden angel cannons in our arms, we may not cause chaos wherever we go, but we are dangerous like Vash. Maybe more so because of how subtle it feels until the very moment it hits. There is no big show of lights contained within a few moments, there's only the chaos in our minds. Our emotions are our weapon. Simply by being us, by existing as we are just like him, we run the risk of absolute terror. It's because we can never help how other people feel. The beauty of human life is in being unique and distinct from everyone around us, a fresh entity which is only capable of witnessing the world through its own lens, an interpretation guided by a set of factors so complex no two people have ever or will ever be the same. Art, music, literature, comedy, none of these would interest us with the same mind. Love, friendship, and romance, none of these would feel special if we were the same person. But it also creates conflict. Because we fail to understand the realities of other people at a basic level, we war, we hate, and we destroy. We turn against our neighbors and those we don't know alike. And we're ever-changing. The way we understand someone and feel about them now won't be the same as it is in 10 years, if we even still know them then. 
what I'm getting at here is still that love is terrifying. It's terrifying because it's a responsibility like no other. We can't help when someone else falls in love with us without trying. The longing of a friend or the gaze of an acquaintance or unrequited emotions are not the domain of personal fault for the object of them. If we took responsibility for our unique natures which make us desirable, then we'd all be scattered off in isolation. But when we reciprocate, when we have a hand in that love and then change or realize we feel different or learn that we didn't even know what we were feeling to begin with, suddenly we're faced with our weapon aimed right at them. There was a specific moment where this hit me for the first time. It was almost five years ago now, but it feels so much more like yesterday. I'd been with someone for something like four months. We met at college, but over summer break we were two hours and fifteen minutes away, a route punctuated by a small sandwich shop at exactly halfway, one marker of many on a route that's forever burned into my mind. With this distance, we'd always swap who traveled on every other weekend trips. It was the end of one of those, the sweltering months of summer where my room was unbearably hot at night, a fact which, of course, didn't stop the human drive for physical connection. I sat up afterwards, looking at the depressingly faint view of city lights in the distance from my window, and for a moment acted out my desires of living life like a movie, spilled a bit of my guts, the motivations for what I wanted in life that I never tell anyone. I didn't just want to get closer to those lights, I wanted it to be the reason they existed. I reveled in the faint musk that lingered, in the way our bodies felt so uncomfortable together but remained bonded anyway, a cool breeze rolling in every now and then to punctuate the moment as the only bit of relief. It was quite perfectly imperfect, the kind of scene I'd always imagined putting in my movie someday. When she got in her car to leave, the door propped open on her elbow as we said goodbye. I saw the look of absolute shock on her face as the few words instinctively slipped out, I love you. Seeing the panic that set in her eyes with a quick recoil, my own instincts of tending to another kicked in. I love you too. A quiet relief seemed to wash over her and sent her home with the kind of smile that accompanies her greatest fears going unproven. The smile that stays, occupying the mind too much to care about traffic or distance, as the songs you'd normally skip play out anyway because nothing is of any concern as that overwhelming happiness is. I felt it once before, but right now I felt much different. It was the moment I'd felt I became a monster. I was used to saying instinctual I love yous even if it was in a different context. My mother ended every single conversation with the phrase since as long as I can remember, which meant I'd been saying it without meaning it for most of my whole life. From years of fighting at home, emotional manipulation and abuse, I knew that she didn't deserve such a thing to be true, saying it was just a procedure to maintain the peace. When I think of that, I remember how few times I've actually said the phrase with meaning in my life. I can't remember a single time that me and my father had even exchanged the words. Any confirmation of the inherent bond we're forced to share is rare to come by. Even in the worst moments where emotion couldn't be avoided, when I turned that corner at the rehab facility and immediately saw how much of a toll the process took on his body, the moment where I came out multiple times for multiple reasons due to necessity, knowing that if I hid forever, I wouldn't be hiding for that long. Every time bawling my way through the words, we sat or stood at the same distance that had separated us for years, however far the couch is from that big chair. There were a few times I heard, said, and meant those words, though. Somewhere in the half-finished basements of the most paper of towns where I grew up, I sat anxiously, my mind overcome with one single thought, as any and every movie played out the role of background noise, incomprehensible over my own mind. Will she say it back? I was 16. The prior 15 years had been spent in a stupor of absurd awkwardness. The only connections I had and maintained were from grade school. I used to ask the teacher who could I be friends with, and I'd stick with whoever they pointed me to, one friend a year, since I'd end up in a different class every year. I panicked every time I was called on and saved my maybe seven sentences I spoke a day for that one friend. My parents were divorced, my mom worked nights, so there was nothing at home to say. What I'm getting at is that my connections were pretty thin. The fact that I'd found someone and made an impression enough to start dating them was an amazing and a testament to how powerful mutual interests can be. We were both in theater, the first school activity I'd ever done, and it gave us a lot of time together. 
I asked her out a couple times. The first time was only because word got around that I liked her because I told everyone and asked them what they thought, and then people said she already knew, so I had to ask in that very high school way, and it led to a pretty clear rejection. But a second try a few weeks later when I heard that maybe she was interested now in a very high school way and at something like 1am in an after party for one of our shows and we were a thing. Everything we knew of love we were learning together in those awkward interactions that followed all the way to the first time she said I love you seven months in. The very same night I was debating so hard whether or not I should say it. I was overjoyed. I don't think I'd ever felt so much relief in an instant. I immediately set it back, held her closer, and spent the rest of the night unable to wipe that smile off my face. And I imagine it was a lot like the one my partner would feel some five years later. And that's what terrified me in that moment. I knew how good it felt. I knew how much simple words and gestures from one person could mean to another. A card from someone you don't know is nice, but it sits there for a few days and then goes in the trash. But one from someone you love like that, it goes in the special box under the bed you keep for silly memories, knowing one day you'll both look back on it and reminisce about the good old days that led you here together. It's knowing, but not knowing. That's what I did with my high school girlfriend. Like I said, we were learning love from each other. We both had divorced parents who remarried, but with shaky relationships even then, my mom would be divorced again only a few years later. And I think about that a lot. I think, what if I'd been less resistant? What if I'd learned from my father's mistakes and been kind to someone I was supposed to share a bond with? Maybe those two wouldn't have had so much tension between them to divorce if I was a bit more kind. That's just... wishful thinking, though. Anyway, the point is that neither of us knew what it meant. So when it turned from puppy love honeymoon into tell me exactly where you are, leave your friends because I hate them, don't sit too close to me or talk unless I say so, I just thought that's what love was. You give everything to someone, so I guess losing everything wasn't that big of a deal, it was just natural. We watched her movies and went with her friends and paid attention to her and her needs and with no frame of reference, emotional manipulation was just what love looked like. It was better than the fights my parents had, which left holes in the doors, little reminders I'd pass by every day saying, what you have must not be that bad then. I was convinced I'd marry someone who actively hated me, riding the high of that real first I love you. She was my life, present and future, with the past clearly given up. When we were good, I could manage life. I'd wake up and go to school and exist so I could go to hers after. But when it seemed like things might end, I couldn't do anything. I stayed at home, laying in bed with comfort shows to drown out any and every thought that could enter my mind except for when I got around to cutting myself up a bit in the hopes it would let her know that I was hurting too. <sighs> I wasn't quite clean in all of this either. I didn't know how to say what I was feeling and I wasn't trying to learn. I thought talking about anything, addressing it, and bringing it into frame would just lead to things ending because we'd realize how awful they were. So I did my own bit of manipulation too. I was weak, reliant on her hate. I needed something to live for, even if it was that. And things ended a few times and started back up a few times, creating a roller coaster of life until the final one. For a few months at a time, each time I would shut down, overcome by such a minor grief that seemed like the whole world, because to me it really was. I learned how easily love could make and break all that we are. It's a big part of why it terrifies me even to this day. I'm weak. It can overcome everything I know in an instant. When I instinctively said I love you again for the first time since then, five years later in college, I couldn't handle the feeling. Suddenly I had taken a responsibility that changed the relationship. I had to reciprocate to a high degree. I had taken on the emotions of another out of the bad habits formed from my youth, the instinctual I love you. Now I couldn't ignore that I was a huge part of her world. There was no more plausible deniability. No way I could act like it was no big deal. I knew that look because I'd felt that look. I knew the power I had and I, I didn't want it. I was just living out some stupid movie fantasy of hot summer nights, content to be finding my way through however long a random college relationship would be, and now it was more. I never recognized it up until that point, and well, not even until after that point, but I was afraid of loving someone after high school and after being used as an emotional outlet for people with terrible partners many times since. 
I think the switch flipped that moment when I stopped caring and just went for it when someone I was in love with reciprocated for one day and then backed out with a text the next. The exact, exact moment was probably when I was buying cough syrup to abuse so I could fall asleep that night, missed my turn off exit, slammed the car into reverse and floored it backwards to reach that exit again. Luckily it was late and the small town highway was empty, but it's like the literal impact of that break in reverse is what flipped the switch. Divorced parents twice, emotional abuse, a balance from every form of love, it sucked, I hated it, it only hurt, I didn't want to love anyone, I just wanted my movie moments. But I never knew I was afraid of being loved too until someone for the first time truly loved me. Looked at me like the whole world and treated me like it too. Showed me off to their friends, to their family, took a picture of all the moments to remember, planned their life around me. Maybe she should get her masters at the school back where I lived so we could stay together. Someone was willing to change the entire course of their life for me. I, what was I supposed to do with that? Some worthless twerp from nowhere paper town, trudging their way through a degree they didn't want, holding on to the hope that they weren't wrong and transferring schools to keep making YouTube videos for 20 subscribers with their best friend who by the time they got to that school hated them. I had nothing. I was nothing. I wasn't worthy of changing someone's life. All those words, just an excuse not to care. The responsibility got to me. I started to panic. I couldn't handle ruining the life of someone heading in such a positive direction. Graduating early and prepping for a master's to get a job that would actually help people face to face. What if, because of me, she never got to do that? What if loving me kept her from helping all those people she would? Because she is someone nice and kind and caring and who loves and is worthy of love all for someone who so clearly wasn't, who so clearly isn't. I kept finding excuses not to end it though. There were weddings and birthdays and finals. There was always some reason not to end it yet, not to ruin their life yet. But I knew I had to. I knew that when they introduced me to all their kind and caring friends for their birthday and I left early after staying silent the whole time so I could work on a project, that I would only make things worse to keep going, becoming like the one who manipulated me all those years ago coming to hate someone but keeping them anyway. I couldn't do that, but either way it hurt. Maybe it would be better to torture myself forever crying alone that I had to destroy someone's world than actually doing it. And that is the most I've ever cried. That's how weak I am, how little I can handle other people's pain, the th thought of breaking someone's heart, of putting them through the dark, sobbing showers and lifeless days in bed I knew was something I couldn't even handle the thought of. I cried more when I finally said it to her, too. I cried afterwards when I had to think of her crying all alone. I cried a lot, and she did, too. Two people in some of the worst moments of their life because I had let myself be loved. So I never wanted to do it again. Every relationship past that point, I tanked at the first hint of danger. I wanted them to feel angry at me, to hate me, and turn that energy into something else so they wouldn't cry alone. I turned into a workaholic, telling people who feel for me that I couldn't. I just didn't have the time for them. And even when I did like someone, I wouldn't show it. I would never say it. I'd be lively and fun on dates, but I wouldn't text back for days until they found me worthless. I'd be lying on their chest and feel the vibrations of the way they said the words, I can't tell if you like me or not. That was the point, you idiot. I didn't want you to know. Knowing was dangerous. Knowing meant pain was on the horizon. Knowing. I just didn't want to know. But don't get me wrong. The isolation and self-hate wasn't enough to keep the monster in. Love is too strong to be penned in like that. Eventually, I was forced out of that shell. A friend paid for me to follow him on vacation and act so kind and so already paid for that... I couldn't say no and was forced to let down that barrier of I can't and experience the world again for the first time in years. I met someone hundreds of miles away and fell in love in that one single night. Staying up until 2am on a Monday night looking for anywhere that was open to get out of the cold and keep talking, trying every place, seeing them closed or so slow or not having enough staff and eventually winding up at some under construction hole in the wall pizza place that we had to get and take back to the hotel I was at but couldn't take her into the room because my friends were staying in the room asleep already and just 
One of those nights I'll never forget. But it ended, and I'd never see them again after they'd walked down that long hall. Shamefully, I even forgot their name because I only asked once and didn't remember. I don't even have a name. Two nights later, I became that for someone else. I went out, met someone, and proved to myself that I was someone who could be loved like I'd just felt. The issue wasn't me. But really, it was them who proved it. The shower serenade, the way they looked at me with every word, the hope they had that even with so much distance soon to be between us, things would somehow turn into something. I'll always remember how they said they wanted a place designed for fun and memories, but could only feel that they missed me. I purposefully became the object of a painful longing for my own ego. But that's a story as long as this whole video for another time. I am a monster of love. It terrifies me. It's the most worrisome part of this human existence I have to live. I've loved and been hurt, been loved and hurt, felt too worthless for it and used it to feel worthwhile. And knowing all of this, saying all these words here today, acknowledge the weapon and wielded it purposefully. It's the source of my worst days and my best, how I lifted others up and tore them down just the same. It's my greatest fear in so many ways. And yet, and yet here I am, always giving it another try. It's even scarier for that. It's such a worthwhile thing. It'll make us risk the ends of our worlds and others all over again and again and again. It's something so dangerous that we can't live without it. I'm not telling you that the fear of it should say you should avoid it. I'm telling you it's a fear that we have to confront. I'm telling you that that's the only choice we ever have. We will love and be loved no matter what, and we deserve to be loved and loved no matter what. Embracing it is the only choice we have.